Thank you for tuning in to High Green, the official podcast of the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society. High Green is funded by your membership in the society, and any opinions expressed throughout the show are solely those of the owner. As always, if you'd like to learn more about our organization or join us, you can find our website, www.bmrrhs.org. Perhaps this story hasn't been told in B&M circles, but it's, it's a B&M story and it's a good one. Oh my God, he says, I don't think I ever saw a train down here before. <laughs> he was amused. <laughs> I still have that wanderlust. I still want to go back rowing. Welcome back to High Green. My name is Rick Kafori. This week we'll be featuring the final part of our two-part interview with Bruce Davison. Bruce worked for a number of short line railroads in New Hampshire in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Short lines that were formed on trackage that had once belonged to the Boston and Maine Railroad. Last week we heard Bruce's stories working for the Claremont and Concord Railway. And this week we'll hear about his experiences on the Wolfboro Railroad Central Division between Concord and Lincoln, New Hampshire, as well as his experiences on the New England Southern Railroad operating on that same line, as well as the New Hampshire Division main line from Concord to Manchester and Concord up the old northern main line towards Penacook and even further north into Andover, New Hampshire. We hope you enjoy the rest of Bruce's interview, and as always, thank you so much for listening. So how did you go from there to the Wolfboro Railroad? Well, and specifically the Central Division. Central Division. I, in, in, in the 1973, uh, I started going over and volunteering over the Wolfboro Railroad Eastern Division. And I did that. And the guys at Claremont said, you crazy? Work here five days a week? Then you go over there and work for free on the weekends? He said, what's the matter with you? I said, well, I'm, I'm learning stuff. I get to work with steam. I, I fired the 250 once. That was enough. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I was working with some, you know, some pretty ancient equipment, some pretty interesting equipment. So they got to know me. I left the Claremont and Concord after I got married in June, of, uh, June 1st, 1975. I left in October. In the interim, I built a workshop and I was going to go into full-time antique restoration. And I did that one winter, and it gets pretty lonely out in the middle of nowhere. You're finishing furniture, and just start to that feel about, gee, I'd like to go back railroading again. And then lo and behold, I got a phone call from Jimmy Moore from the Wolfboro Railroad. And he said to me, he says, I got your name as a reference for Dave King. I'd worked with Dave King on the Claremont Concord. He says he's applied for an engineer's job on the Central Division. But this time, the Central Division up and running. And Jim said, you know, we need to, he said, I need to get back on the East, Eastern Division, get things ready for the tourist season. So, so we need to get, get people for the Central Division. He says, so how about Dave King? I said, yeah, he's a pretty good engineer. I said, we work together. He's pretty competent. It's okay. He said, we also need a conductor. He said, you interested? You betcha. Yeah. So that was my interview. Yeah. Let's see, he already knew me. So that, that helped. Right. I got my foot in the door. So I went working there. He said, uh, we'll call you and set up a time to learn the line. You and Dave can come over and learn the track. So we learned, we went over there, learned the track, uh, Laconia, to uh, Lakeport to uh, Concord, and then another day, uh, Lakeport to Lincoln. After that, we're on our own. So there I am working with an RS-3, never worked with something that big. That thing rolled like a Cadillac compared to a 44-tonner. Yeah. So that worked pretty well uh, while the paper mill was running in, in uh, Lincoln. That kept us pretty busy, and we'd Often we'd, we'd run one day to one day down to uh, Concord and then the next day go to Lincoln. I remember a few times we did the whole thing in one day. That was quite a round trip. Okay. A, lot of, a lot of crossings to flag, a lot of slow orders. Yep. We made for a, a long, long day. We didn't do that very much. Mm -hmm. And then the, when the paper mill 
close down, then things get pretty lean. They were running excursions, ran some springtime excursions, Concord to Lincoln, when they first started in April. I even bought a ticket and rode that, and then a month later I was working there. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. I could, I could have saved my money, I guess. Yeah. And then they ran excursions from Laconia to Meredith during the summertime. We just call that the turkey. And Dave King was, was engineer. And I was, sometimes I was working the head end with him. Sometimes I'd work in the coach with Ray Welch. Uh, it varied some. But Dave would go as fast as he could. So we have as long of a layover at Weir's Beach as we could so we could look at the women on the boardwalk. And that was memorable. So that, that lasted until uh, Labor Day. That was the end of that. Then we ran some fall foliage trips up to Lincoln, Concord to Lincoln again. Yep. And then after that, things really slowed down. And it, in the end, it got to the point where it was Dick Mauser, Brian Woodard, and myself, we were running the whole thing. And by this time, we we're only going as far as Plymouth. And that was for coal for O.A. Miller, which made shoe trees which later on became part of Rochester Shoe Tree. And they shut that plant down and built, built one down where the Lakes Region shipping used to be in Ashland. Yep. And then we used to get uh, carloads of feed for uh, Merrimack Farmers in Plymouth. And that was it. So from Meredith to Plymouth, there wasn't much traffic. And to go up Ashland Hill, yep. it, was, it was not good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the central division was hemorrhaging red ink. So the last trip we made to Plymouth, we had a cow to feed, set up for Merrimack farmers, getting ready to leave, and then this big Cadillac, or maybe it's a Lincoln, pulls up. It was Herb Goodwin, later on, Goodwin Railroad. Yep. Him and Jimmy Moore and Don Halleck, they came and looked at the 101. They were going to buy the 101. And Don Halleck said, Well, boys, this is your last day. So yeah. Goodwin Railroad takes over tomorrow. And he congratulated us for all the work we'd done and how hard we worked to keep things moving. So Jimmy came up in the cab and said, Well, we're going to buy the locomotive. And he says, We've got openings for two people. He said, There's three of you. So one of you is not going to have a job. Yeah. So we're all kind of sitting there looking at our shoes and hanging our heads. And I finally spoke up and said, well, I can go back to refinishing furniture. So I'll take the hit and you guys keep working. So they breathed a sigh of relief. But it was a, it was a somber trip back to the engine house. We tied up the engine. Then we started grabbing stuff out of the file cabinet. And... And I got all kinds of interesting stuff there, including some stuff in Dave King's own, we'll say, personal file folder. I got interesting stuff. And various other things that we thought we could get away with. Mm -hmm. We might as well have it, because otherwise it'll go in the dumpster. Yeah. And some of Woody's dispatches there? Yeah. Woody's press releases. Press releases, yeah. Oh, we... It was great. Yeah, yeah. That, that's one thing that always stood out to me with the Wolfboro Central, it's just the stories of the workers, I think, the people. It seems to have been the most memorable aspect of, of that operation. I mean, it was only a year anyway. Well, it was it was one of those things that if it seems too good to be true, that's right. Yep. It is too good to be true. And it, it just seemed like the <clears throat> like the most perfect job. Yeah. And, you know, that was my first taste of, of the high iron, and I liked it. Yeah. You know, a big engine... Pretty decent track, could move right along in some places, so it gave me a pretty good taste for it. But when it when it folded up, you know, I still had that wanderlust. I still want to go back railroading. So once again, I picked up the phone and said, "Hey, Pete, you hiring?" Yeah. He said, "Yep, come on up. We can use you." And he he'd always told me, he said, "If you ever need a job, call. We'll find a way to." help you out and give yeah. you a job. So Pete really liked me and I liked him and I liked working for the Claremont Concord. 
and I and I worked there until my Volkswagen engine swallowed a valve on Newbury Hill, and that was it. Um, I had no other car. I just couldn't stay, and I had to leave, and I hated to leave, but I had really had no choice. Yeah. That's back when gas was a dollar and a half a gallon, and it was it was just killing me to drive up there and kill me to leave. At that point, I figured, well, my railroad career is over, unless I'm willing to move, and I really wasn't willing to move. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess I'll concentrate on on the rail fan hobby, and on refinishing antiques, build my business up. So that was going pretty good. And then I uh, got a phone call from, from uh, Peter Dearness in 1985. And he uh, identified himself and he said, uh, you come highly recommended as a conductor by Wayne Wheeler. And he said, we're going to be starting, be starting running Concord to Manchester and we need people. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm interested. So, okay, so I'm, I'm up at the boardwalk at Weir's Beach, and this was bike weekend. He said, I'm giving out, you know, pamphlets for the, for the Winnipesaukee Railroad. He said, could you come up and I could interview you then? I said, I don't really want to come up on bike weekend to Weir's Beach. So he paused. He said, well, I guess I could interview you right now on the phone. I said, I think that'd be better. So he interviewed me for a couple of minutes. And he says, uh, I'll be in touch when, when we get ready to start. He says, you got the job. So there again, I still haven't ever filled out a written job application up to this point. So he calls me up. A few weeks later, he says, rules class is going to be next week down in Manchester. So Wayne Wheeler and I carpooled to rules class at the Queen City Motel. And we spent a week B&M, get B&M qualified. And Wayne and I each got 100 on the signal test, the best scores on the signal test. I never worked in signal territory in my life, but I memorized those those flashcards pretty good. And did pretty well on the written test, but Ann Oschlager beat us all. I think she got a 97. Oh, yeah. And she never worked, a railroad, worked for a railroad in the day of her life. Yeah. So it was pretty interesting. Um, I worked a little bit. Uh, out of Lakeport before uh, before we started going to Manchester and worked there a few times. And then once we got going to Manchester, uh, Wayne Wheeler and I were the first crew. It was July 14th, 1985. First crew to Manchester and back. And Wayne and I were working six and sometimes seven days a week. Yep. We were some busy. I never saw paychecks that size. Went a long ways to buy more equipment for my shop. And it was it was busy. I mean, it was really, really busy. Yeah. And nobody had really show us any shortcuts or anything about switching Concord. Most of Concord yet had been torn up, so there wasn't, weren't very many tracks, a lot of cars. And the most helpful person of all was the, the guy that worked in the yard at uh, HK Webster. He, he showed us how the B&M guys switched H.K. Webster, so we learned a lot of tricks from him. So it was an education, it was an experience. And now I'm getting into the bigger time railroading with signals and everything. Yeah. Now this is this is getting really interesting. Mm -hmm. Big power, GPs, I mean, that's... Yeah, nice to have some, some big stuff, a Jeep 18, a Jeep 7. Yeah. Uh, put the two of them together, that was really nice. Yeah. And the 581 for a bit, too. 581 was wonderful. Oh, yeah. what, a, what a locomotive that was. Yeah. I took a took my tape recorder with me one day. We were hauling salt out of Manchester. And we came out of Manchester with 20 loads of salt, uh, right in the eighth notch. And this, going through the old mill yard along Canal Street, just the echoing roar of that engine. Pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. It was great. The, the lease the lease that you guys had from from Concord to Manchester also included the section of the northern as far as Penacook. How often did you guys run up to Rivco and Penacook? When we first took over, we're going to Penacook probably four days a week. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, Rivco was getting a tremendous amount of cars in, and only unload two at a time. So we'd set, set two cars up for them, and you know, they'd be ready for two more uh, the next day. We're also getting cars in for steam decks in, in there yeah. on the back track. So there was a, a pretty fair amount of business into Pentecook uh, in those early days. And then when the first strike hit, some of uh, Rivco's cars got trapped. They couldn't access them. Ponderosa pine is a very high value commodity and it cost them a ton of money because they had already had to pay for this it's sitting in the cars, plus they had to buy more and truck it in. Yeah. So it was a double whammy for them. That pretty much killed the Rivco business for us. The Guilford strikes? The Guilford strike. Yeah. yeah. And the same happened with uh, Rochester Shoe Tree up in Ashland. Yeah. They had to get other cars in while they had their cars trapped. And they were getting them into White River Junction and, and transloading them on the CV to trucks. And that worked so well for them, they just kept doing it. Yeah. And that was the end of that business. And they still do it now. Yep. Yeah. Even though siding is still there. Yeah. Um, so, sort of running off the Pentecook thing was the ballast trains on the northern. That's kind of an interesting story behind that. Yep. In 1987, there was a fiber optic cable being laid between uh, White River and Manchester along the, along the B&M, on the northern. <clears throat> and part of the contract was that they had to restore the ballast profile to the same as what it was before they put the uh, cable in there. So the idea was to uh, use the ballast cars and to run ballast. And the idea was to run it all the way from Lebanon the whole line. Well, there's some washouts along the line in Danbury, so they couldn't run all the way to all the way up to uh, West Lebanon to get the stone. What they finally wound up doing was loading the cars at Gale Siding, which was just west of Potter Place, and they would uh, load the cars. First, first bunch they did. They went right down to Concord and started unloading the ballast right at Concord and working their way north. They could just keep doing that, just keep doing that. And we did this for about a month, on Saturdays and Sundays. It was June of 1987. And we called it uh, Nessie Does Ballast, which was a takeoff on a uh, adult movie of that uh, time. And when that was done, that was the last rail moves on the northern. Yeah. But the first run up there was Martin Shapiro, engineer, and I was conductor. And I said, Marty, I said, we're going to do 10 miles an hour. I said, the brush is horrible. Neither of, us, neither of us has ever been on this line before, so we're not really qualified on the physical characteristics. I said, we don't know where the crossings are. We're going to stop and protect every crossing. Yeah. So that's just what we did. We stopped and protect. And the track was still in pretty good shape. But the brush was horrible. So we got to Potter Place, and uh, the uh, the switch up at uh, up at Gale was a trailing point switch. So we'd have to back the cars in. So what we did at Potter Place, we we ran around the cars and got on the south end of the cars and shoved them up to Gale. And then we pulled the engine and the cars into the siding. When, once the cars were, were loaded, we just push out the siding, normal up the switch, and head south. Yeah. Well, the problem with this is the switch hadn't been thrown in probably, who knows, 25 or 30 years. It was rusted solid. What we had to do is flip the switch stand over on its side, bar the points over the bar, and, and spike the points over. Yeah. So we'd spike them over each way. So that was a little time consuming. The runaround track at Potter Place had trees eight, ten feet high growing through it. So we just bulldozed our way through there with the engine. And the next week when we came back, Roger Emerson, whose uh, father was a signalman on the line, and 
who was a member of the Potter Place Historical Society, Andover Historical Society, he'd gone in there with a chainsaw and cleaned all that out. Yep. So that was really nice. It was really nice of him to do that. And there were some big trees in there. So that was quite a surprise to us. So Roger got to ride with us quite a little bit. And uh, thanking him for that. But we, we did it. We took pictures. I wish I'd taken more pictures. You know, usual lament. Yeah. But when I was working, I was taking pictures. When I wasn't working, I was still up there taking pictures. Yeah. So, did a lot with Nessie Does Ballast. Must have been pretty surprising people in Franklin to see that. I've seen that. You know, and thereabouts. There were a lot of people surprised. We had a lot of people coming out and they'd meet us at the crossings and say, you got to start running trains again? The train's back, and it's a just a temporary thing. It's just work trains. No freight trains? I said, no, not at this time. And people were kind of disappointed. Yeah. One day, a, a very a funny thing happened one day. Martin Shapiro was engineer, and Pete Dearness was conductor on the train. And I'm taking pictures, and we're at Potter Place. And there was a small crowd of people gathered around right there. And Roger Emerson got off, because he lived right there. He got off, headed home. This is the last run of the day. Heading for Concord. And this woman standing there with a little child, probably about three years old, and she said, my, my son's never been on a train. He's never, never had a train ride. And she hands the child to Peter. And, and Peter holds on to the kid. And Marty stops. And he could hand the kid back to the mother. But the kid probably got a, you know, 30 or 40 foot train ride. <laughs> uh, I got a picture of it, yeah. of this uh, train ride. That was funny. That'd be great. Kid had a very brief run on the Northern. Yeah. And so for the rest of the time, you would have been running mostly Manchester to Concord and Concord to Manchester? Pretty much. Yeah, and, a lot of salt. A lot of salt. Yeah. You know, and of course, running up to Pennacook. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I'd run up on the Concord Lincoln line too. It all, every day was different. Yeah. And that's what I liked about the about the railroad. <coughs> it was not monotonous. Yeah. It was it was never never boring. There was always something going on. And the salt could get very heavy. Uh, International Salt and Bow could unload seven cars at a time. So we'd seven out, seven in. Uh, pretty much every night. The Perini siding would be full of salt cars. And we handled a lot of salt. A lot of salt went through there. And, you know, Blue Seal Feed was a, was a big customer and had a lot of other team track. We had Fortech for telephone poles. There was, there was a lot of business in Concord. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, was, it was a busy place. But as time went on, business just faded. Yeah. It just slowly went away. Right. And we were working less and less. It, it got to the point where it was getting hard for me to, you know, to make a good living there. Yeah. Um, and that's when you left New England Southern? That's when I left New England Southern. I worked there nine and a half years. And I left to come up here to Maine and work for the St. Lawrence in Atlantic as an engineer. I'd always worked as a conductor and, and some as an engineer, but my, my real love was, was working as a conductor. I liked being a conductor. So I came up here, they needed engineers. Didn't need, any engine, didn't need any conductors. They already hired a couple. Right. So I, I came up here and worked as an engineer. And I, the, this is the longest I worked in, on any road. I worked here for almost 19 years. Yep. In St. Lawrence and Atlantic. So the best paying years. Uh, it was a union job and paid very well. The benefits were very good. Yep. But I still miss the C&C &C, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, after going, starting there, I mean, just the amount of, traffic and, and the interesting situations is street running, branch running, paper mills, you know, just the variety. It was, it was a, a great variety of traffic, but an interesting cast of characters. I think that's the best part. Yeah. yeah. You know, Bill Dow was a great mechanic. He could make something out of nothing. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen anybody with that, with that kind of talent. Uh, and he was, he was really good at it. Uh, Biff Rainey, probably one of the very best engineers I've ever worked with. Biff was very good. 
You can make those 44 tonners do things that 44 tonners aren't supposed to do. But he'd make them do it. Yeah. And he'd make it look easy. Yeah. And I learned a lot from Biff. He was a great mentor to me. And Clarence Lambert, well, he was kind of grouchy. But he wasn't a bad guy. And uh, just a little high strung. Mark Tewksbury, who I worked with a little later, um, he was just the opposite high strung. He was pretty mellow and pretty good engineer, too. Dave King, well, Dave King was an interesting character. I worked with him after. He, he became the engineer after Clarence Lambert had his heart attack. Worked with him over there, and then worked with him on the Wolfboro Railroad. Yeah. yeah. I think in terms of you know, these all three lines, well, the three lines that you worked for at first, the, the Claremont Concord, the Wolfboro, and the New England Southern, having been former Boston and Maine territories at one point in time, you know, in their in their lives. Uh, what was it, so for somebody that grew up with an appreciation for railroading and an interest in railroading, what was it, what was it sort of like having gone from studying the Boston and Maine to having worked on these Boston and Maine branch lines, but in a different incarnation as these independent short lines. Well, it was interesting to see how railroads actually worked yeah. as compared to the rail fans' uh, version of what railroads are compared to what a railroader's version are, yeah. is. Uh, I, when I got B&M rules qualified to work on the Linden Southern, I learned a lot. Yeah. And I learned a lot about why things were done in a certain way that I just never knew before. So it was an education for me, but it gave me a better appreciation of what was happening. It made the hobby that much more interesting for me. And to see you know, what was like going through Concord, going past the old Concord shops, uh, going into the old engine shop, all these things, you see these various artifacts they have beside the tracks. It was kind of, it was interesting. And you just have to wonder, you know, what it was like when it was a double track main line to Manchester yeah. and down below. All this stuff. You know, semaphores as opposed to searchlight signals. And it gave me a, a pretty good appreciation for what was there mm -hmm. and what the, what the people saw before me. It worked on that line, and and also having had worked, you know, a lot of, a lot of final things too. When you think about the last run in Newport, um, you know, a lot of these runs on the Wolfboro, you know, weren't necessarily the last, but you know, it was sort of the last time. Like paper mill was busy, and these things. Was there is there anything that you you just missed out on in your railroad career that you would have liked to have experienced? Like anywhere you would have liked to have been able to run, or anything you would have liked to have been able to service industries or anything. That. Anything that stands out as having having been too late to experience that? Well, certainly going to Concord on the Claremont and Concord yeah. would have been tops on my list, and going to Henniker on the Claremont and Concord too. Right. Uh, that would have been that would have been the best of the best. Yeah. Uh, but certainly running on the Concord to Lincoln line, I've often thought would have been nice to be able to go from Plymouth to Woodsville. Right. That, that, you know, missed out on that too. All these things, you know, came, you know, they, they were gone before I started railroading. Uh, gone when I was just a little, little kid. So I guess the only way I can look at it now is if I had worked on those things, I wouldn't be here now. That's true. So I guess there's two ways to look yeah, at it. All these pic pictures you're finding now, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have seen. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is, by working on these lines, when I do find a picture that's unidentified, sometimes I can identify it because of my familiarity with, with the, the area. Yeah. So that's come in handy. Too. It's kind of helped you with your hobby, too. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's been a pretty darn good hobby for me. A, a darn good living for me. Yeah. And a really good retirement. That's true. Yeah. Real retirement is... Is very good. Yeah. yeah. What um, I think we know the obvious answer to this question, but out of all the places you worked for, which was your favorite and why? Well, Claremont and Concord. Yeah, for sure. It, it's like your first love. Yeah. You never forget. Right. And the, the Claremont and Concord are just 
it was almost magical. Yeah. You had old trolley line. I mean, running in the street is it's it's nerve wracking. It certainly helped Clarence Lambert's ulcer. Uh, <laughs> you know, survive all those years of, of him assaulting with Maylocks. Yeah. But I, you can see why people would be pretty stressed running in the street because you get to places where there's a hill and there's weeds or grass and you're going and you're not, you just can't stop. Yeah. You don't know where you're going to stop. Right. And that's scary. It certainly twists up your stomach. Oh, yeah. And, you know, people driving down the street some of them don't quite understand why there's this big red thing coming at them. So they're wanting them to move their car. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that happened quite a bit. Oh yeah, parked cars. Yep, yeah. parked cars on the tracks. Yeah, yeah. There's there were things that that I experienced that you know the modern today's railroaders would never see. Like stiff shackling and all that. Stiff shackle. Yeah. The re-railers that we had, the clamshell re-railers yep. in the street. All these things that just gone. Just gone. Yeah. Push polling we used to do a little of that. Yep. Yeah. All these things that just aren't they just aren't done. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that's why the C and C is sort of a legendary branch line and why you know a branch and, and a short line that people come back to in terms of interest is that it was just so unique in so many ways. Being that street running isn't unique necessarily, but the fact that street running and 44 tonners and the type of freight you were moving and the volume of freight and then the former b and branch line and all these things kind of combined kind of really did make it sort of a magical place. Sort of like a, sort of like a, a modeler's delight. Yes. Like a, almost like a f fantasy world of, of railroading, but very functional at the same time. Well, street running, a couple of covered bridges really tight curves. Yep. I mean, what's not to like? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and it, and, it, and it worked. It worked very well. Yeah. It was a very profitable uh, operation. It, it had everything going for it. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's my favorite railroad. It always will be. Mm -hmm. And the, the Wolfboro Central Division, that was just too good to be true. Yeah. And because it was too good to be true, it was gone. I mean, you talk about just a perfect setup. I mean, that was that was it. Yeah. But and when, if the tra if the traffic had held, it would have been great. Mm -hmm. But the, when, the, when the mill closed in Lincoln, that was the end of it. But other than that, it was it was pretty good. Yeah. We, we had a really good time. There. Had way too much fun. <laughs> the branch line excursion, the rumble, branch line, branch line, ramble. branch line ramble. Yeah. 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 That branch line ramble. Went from Lakeport. It was a, done as a fundraiser for the Wolfboro Branch Railroad Club. Went from Lakeport out the Lakeshore Branch to McDonald's on Union Avenue in Laconia, and stopped for the the food. And everybody gets off the train, grabs something to eat, and then once everybody gets their food, back on the train, away we go. Yeah. Head out to the to the main line. Go down to Tilton. Northfield, run around the train, two cars, and we shove them down the Franklin Tilton Bridge, down as far as the upside down covered bridge. Jim Moore's on the on the end of the car with a dump hose to dump the air when we get to the bridge. And Dave King's in the engine. And I'm in the engine. You can't see a thing because the brush is so thick. The only crossing on there is uh, Cross Mill Road. Yep. And uh, Billy Remington was, was flagging that for us. So we just started pushing. No radio, just the dump hose. So we get down there, down below Cross Mill Road. You know, we're going to be getting close, maybe. And the air dumps. So when the air dumped, we just stopped. Yeah. We covered the air and just pulled out. And what we didn't know at the time, we were, the first coach was about halfway across the Halfway out on the bridge. Oh, yeah. We didn't know that. So that gave people a little bit of a thrill, I'm sure. Yeah. Then we got back on the main line, and Don Halleck says to me, he said, you know, we're supposed to go out the Quinty siding, which was 
almost like the Belmont branch, ran parallel to the old Belmont branch. So we're running out of time. It's getting dark. People are getting kind of anxious to get, get going. So, so we'll skip that. Yep. Okay, so we highball right past Belmont branch, got to Lakeport, let everybody off, put the cars away, put the engine away, and uh, I get get back in my car and drive down to Northfield to my in-law's house, and I dropped my wife off there earlier. Well, in the meantime, she'd gone into labor, and the dog had run out into traffic and broken her nose, got hit by a car and broke her nose. So the dog's in the veterinary clinic, my wife's in labor, and I'm heading for home, I'm exhausted. Yeah. So I went and got a little bit of sleep, and then she said, time to go to the hospital. My son was born about 10 a.m. that next morning yeah. after the branch line ramble. Yep. So it was it was a busy time. And the state wasn't too happy about that. No. Is that is that right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Wolfboro Railroad did not have any rights to get on the Franklin Tilton branch. Right. And when wind they got got wind of it down at the state, yep. uh, Don Hallett got a letter. Uh, informing him that he was to never, ever, ever do this again. <laughs> and Don had this poster right on the bulletin board at the office in Wolfboro. Well, if somebody had sent me a letter like that, I'd have put it in the deepest, darkest file folder and never to be seen again. Yeah. Uh, so needless to say, we never went down the never F&T down branch again. Nothing ever did, I don't think. Nope. Yeah. At the end of that. Yeah. But there just wasn't much. There's nothing, nothing below Tilton. No. I think Canterbury. Nope, nothing um, in Canterbury. You know, Meredith, we had Prescott Lumber, later on Garrity. Yep. Had two sidings, had the had the dock down by where you guys are, but there was the, one at the other side. The old siding. Yeah. Yeah. They would get, uh, they get windows in their millwork. Yep. Stuff like that from Anderson. Anderson windows would come in there. And then, really nothing till Plymouth. Yeah, there was nothing in Ashland. No. In Plymouth, we just had uh, O.A. Miller with the, with the coal, and they had Merrimack Farmers, and that's it. The mill in Ashland was gone at that point, at the bottom? Yes, yes, that was long gone. Under the, under the bridge, yeah. Yeah. And then nothing more until we get to Lincoln. In, in Plymouth, the, um, the, the, the shoe tree mill that got coal before it moved to, to Ashton. Was that in the Foster's complex? In the what complex? The, the boiler room complex. It's now the common man there. No. No? That was a peg mill, I think. That was the, that was peg mill. Uh, Rochester shoot, the uh, O.A. Miller shoot tree was on Main Street. Oh, okay. A big brick building on Main Street. Yep. I don't know what it is now. Maybe it's part of the college. Probably. If it's even still there, they redid that whole... It was, big, it was a big building. Yeah. It was pretty substantial. When they put in the traffic circle there, they uh, they, they demolished some, some stuff there. Mm -hmm. The original bridge. Yeah. Memorial Bridge or whatever it was. The peg mill was interesting. They didn't really have a connection with the railroad. No. They did not have a switch. They had a, a crane. You've probably seen the, the, the crane they had. Yeah, a rail crane. Rail crane. When they got that, came in by rail, and they cut the main line and just put it over onto their track and put that crane in there. And there were some pictures on uh, on eBay that went, probably some Alan Thomas stuff. It was. Quite a little process. I want to say it was sitting, sitting off in the weeds or something mm -hmm. into the early 70s. I don't know about the later 70s. Well, yeah. Yeah, it, it sat there for a while. I remember seeing it. Yep. And the mill just kind of fizzled. Fizzled on. Now it's a, a spa and hotel. Yeah. <laughs> so, huh? Amazing. It is. It's interesting. A lot of the, you know, you look at Manchester or any of these places that had mills, and a lot of them are tech companies or colleges and yeah. restaurants, hotels. Kind of makes sense as to why the short line thing didn't work out for a lot of places. Because mm -hmm. the industry just shifted over to service from... from right. From manufacturing. Well, you know, Manchester, look at all the different ones. You had, you had Habitat Soups. Yeah, Habitat Soups, right. <laughs> that was the last one in the mill yard. That was the last, last customer in the mill yard. Yeah. I think Dick Anderson got a 
picture the last car. He did. Silver Brothers was there, but then they moved down to um, the M&L yeah. by the airport. Um, gosh, all the companies up on the Portsmouth branch. You know, Central Paper was up on the Portsmouth branch to begin go. with. Yeah. And, then, and then we moved to South Manchester. Uh, the Union Leader, International Paper. Yeah. There's so many of them. And now there's two or three. <laughs> you know, when, when I was a kid, you know, my father goes shopping once a month. Yep. And he did a big shopping. He buy buy supplies for his woodworking shop, that JJ Morrow's. Yep. He bought finish from a paint store, Stan's paint store, somewhere a little further away, yep. east, towards East Manchester. And he'd go to Beverly Beef if they had a deal on food, go to Ferretti's if they had a deal on food. And I always went to Mammoth Mills. So, I'm living in Mammoth Mills many, many times. Yep. Hear the train go by. There's no windows in Mammoth Mills. Yeah. You can't run to the window and look. Yeah. The only way you see it is you'd have to go, go down. Everything's on the second floor where we're shopping. So you have to go down to the first floor, go out, go around the building by that time. They're halfway to Portsmouth. Yeah, they were. They would move. Yeah, at least in Manchester, the track was pretty in pretty good shape. Yeah, because the, the switcher, and then Johnny's Isle is right across the street. Oh yeah, Cherrytown Road. Yep, yeah. the wigwag. Yeah, yeah. We used to go to Johnny's Isle. My father liked the, the the seconds of chocolates. Oh yeah. You know, chocolates would be dented or they'd be misshapen. Or he loved it. Forty nine cents a pound. Yeah. Jeez, wonder he didn't have any. It's wonder he had any teeth left at all. Yeah. And then that wraps up this week's episode of High Green. If you'd like to be on the show or know somebody who might have some interesting stories about the Boston and Maine Railroad or its legacy, please reach out to us. You can email us at bmrrhs at gmail.com or send us a message right on Facebook. Thanks so much for listening, and we hope to have you back next time for some more great stories about the Boston and Maine Railroad and its legacy right here in New England. <laughs>